Welcome everyone to uh, our 2020-2021 uh, lecture series on MR of the musculoskeletal system. We'll start out this year with the knee. Uh, we'll talk about technical factors, the menisci, ligaments, synovium, and later in the year we'll come back and talk about masses of the musculoskeletal system. There are a number of technical factors we can talk about. We won't spend a lot of time on all of these anymore. Field strength, scanner design, and protocols. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about a few of these. A couple of the scanners that you'll be seeing will be imaging with some low field scanners, including 0.2 Tesla and 0.3 Tesla scanners. And uh, this small 1.0 Tesla scanner uh, will also be uh, viewing images uh, from these scanners, as well as the traditional 1.5 and 3T. We'll also have scanners that are 1.2 Tesla that are uh, uh, kind of large scanners for large people as well. Now, the coil is very important in the musculoskeletal system. This is a very old knee coil from the early 1990s. Uh, in order to receive the signal efficiently, you really like the coil placed close to whatever the anatomic part is in the body. So when you go out into practice, the coil design of the coils used for the different joints will be important and will be at, it's at least as important as field strength in determining image quality. I won't go through our protocols because they vary a lot from location to location. Uh, uh, this was a question from an, an article from 2016 is 3 uh, T Tesla superior to 1.5 Tesla, and uh, uh, diagnosing uh, injuries of the knee. It was a meta-analysis from a number of different papers, and the, the bottom answer is no, and that's been pretty much my experience as well. In the early days, when 3T first came out, people were very excited about it, and a lar large amount of that was because there were new 3T scanners, and they were comparing them to old 1.5T scanners. Uh, for most of my career, I've done a lot of brain imaging, because uh, I started out really in neuroradiology, and I do believe that 3T is substantially better for brain imaging. Uh, and I like it for most spine imaging, though at the spine it becomes a little bit equivocal. Uh, but uh, in the joints, I've, we have a lot of 3T scanners, we have a lot of 1.5T scanners, and I, I really haven't found a big difference between those in most things. Maybe some of the articular cartilage work that we do, uh, where we're really looking for T1 row or T2 mapping sequences, the added signal to noise can be helpful. But for standard imaging, as long as you use uh, adequate protocols and proper coils and modern software, I, I really don't think there's a big difference. So I, I pretty much agree with this. I do, however, believe there's a big difference between 1.5 and the lower field scanners. Uh, we just can't get the same contrast and resolution except for some specific areas and looking for small erosions in uh, patients with uh, inflammatory joint disease, and we'll have lectures about this later in the year. Uh, the ability to use gradient echo images at low fields of view with very thin or 3D slices in a reasonable amount of time and good signal to noise uh, is actually very beneficial. And uh, there was a time when I really preferred low field scanning for uh, looking for bone erosions than higher field scanning because in high fields scanning the gradient echo images lose a lot of contrast. Uh, but there are other techniques now that can be used at high field, which I think have narrowed the gap there. But otherwise, 1.5 and 3T is substantially uh, superior to lower field strength scanners. An issue that we have in the musculoskeletal system, especially with a lot of old metallic implants, is to do with metal artifact, which you're all very familiar with. Uh, I won't go through the details here. And if you want later, we can do physics lectures where we can talk about uh, why these uh, artifacts occur. Uh, typically, uh, we use stir imaging for most of our scanners. Some of our scanners have more sophisticated uh, modern uh, sequences which uh, uh, decrease the metal artifact. Uh, we have not uh, added those to most of our scanners because of the cost 
and the fact that uh, we, we get along very well with stir imaging to decrease the artifact in most of these individuals. And here we can just see the Im improvement. And this is a case where you can see uh, this area looks like it may just be artifact, <clears throat> but when we get rid of the artifact, well, with the uh, stress technique, we can see that this is an acute trabecular bone injury, which was a cause of the patient's symptoms. So eliminating the artifact can be very valuable, as you all know. Arthrography, <clears throat> I don't recommend doing arthrography in the knee uh, at all anymore. Modern uh, technologies, especially at high field strength scanners, I really don't think MR arthrography adds anything. And whenever you stick a needle in and you inject anything into the body, you uh, change the physiology. It's no longer the natural state. Uh, you've really changed a lot of things. You've changed anatomy. You get extravasation of contrast. You've changed the pressures within the joint spaces. And I think that can lead to a lot of confusion. So especially in the knee, I, I really don't recommend doing MR arthrography. Some people think it's great for partial meniscectomy. Uh, things have changed now. We now know that uh, degenerative tears uh, should not be operated on. They should not all be uh, removed because uh, any time you do surgery on the meniscus, you increase the rate of degenerative disease. Uh, we'll talk about indications when we get to the meniscus for which, which tears are uh, best treated surgically and which tears are best left alone. Uh, at that particular time. Uh, the bottom line is uh, there are a lot of changes after partial meniscectomy, but unless you have a large displaced tear, there's really not an indication to reoperate in most of those individuals. And here we can see uh, uh, a tear in an arthrogram patient where a little bit of contrast extends into the, uh, the defect in, in the tear. Uh, here's a patient in primary meniscal repair. Uh, people like to give contrast to see whether it extends into the area of the repair to see whether there's mechanical integrity or not. Here we can see the contrast does not go into the area where there is increased signal intensity within the meniscus, presumably meaning that this meniscus is stable and should not be retorn. I mean, should not be reoperated on. Here's another case of a primary meniscal repair where we can see the signal is not as bright as, as contrast. Uh, uh, other things to be concerned about, however, this is a patient with uh, MR arthrography, and we can see that we really don't see the free edge of the meniscus very well. The reason for that, if we look here, the contrast is actually very dark. Uh, this, by mistake, was a two to one dilution of contrast, it should be a 200 to one dilution of contrast, and therefore it's dephasing a signal and we actually get signal loss rather than enhancement. Here you can see that some of the contrast is absorbed by the articular cartilage where it does in lower concentration cause enhancement. So you have to be careful that uh, the contrast is properly diluted. Here again, we can see low signal intensity in all of these images in this particular patient, uh, but this was intraarticular gas, which you can get, which is typically nitrogen when you distract the knee and positioning the patient. Here we can see a focal area of low signal intensity adjacent to the patella. Uh, when we do the axial images, we're actually seeing a fluid level here. Uh, this was actually doing MR imaging after hyaluronic acid was injected into the joint space. So there are other things that can also change the contrast a fluid uh, in the joint space. Here's a situation where we can see that there's some subchondral ebernation, uh, a little bit of probably granulation tissue on the T1 and the uh, proton density fat suppressed sequences, and there's a homogeneous signal in the overlying articular cartilage. This is not normal articular cartilage. The question was, uh, is there a full thickness defect in the articular cartilage? The patient came in and had our an arthrogram to answer that question, uh, we could see that the contrast was not properly diluted, so we lose signal intensity on the T2 weighted images here. And with this was noticed at the time the patient was scanned. The patient was uh, actually taken off the scanner, brought back a couple of hours later, a couple of days later, was rescanned, and here we can actually see much better contrast without the contrast in the joint space with fluid uh, 
against the surface of the articular cartilage showing that there is no defect here. So this is an area of articular cartilage that's lost its proteoglycans, it's early degenerative disease, but it's still mechanically intact, so there's not really a surgical uh, procedure for this particular case. We'll talk a lot more about the biochemistry of articular cartilage when we get to the articular cartilage lectures. One thing I would like to comment on, uh, we have done a number of studies looking at our articular cartilage and correlating MR findings with arthroscopic findings, but what we have found is that there was very poor correlation between MR findings and arthroscopic findings. Uh, and we kind of scratched our heads about it. The arthroscopists could see the findings on the MR, the radiologists could see the findings on arthroscopy, but we couldn't understand why we had different counts of lesions, different size lesions, and different locations of the lesions. So one of the fellows uh, decided to take five cadavers into the arthros arthroscopy suite and do a study where he put suture anchors around the edge of the articular cartilage that could be seen arthroscopically using standard portals. Then we uh, MR scanned those patients and disarticulated the knees and looked at the growth, uh, gross uh, pathology afterwards. And what we actually found to our surprise was that the entire posterior aspect of the articular cartilage here of both the medial and lateral femoral condyles cannot be visualized at arthroscopy. So on MR, when we were talking about posterior lesions, they were way back here, which the arthroscopists could not see. The arthroscopists, on the other hand, called posterior lesions uh, on the lateral side where they are adjacent to the posterior horn, but not more posterior than that. Uh, the central area was a very narrow area between the free edges of the menisci, and the anterior portion of the joint space was uh, actually did not even include the part of the articular cartilage which was adjacent to the anterior horn. So this is what the arthroscopist saw, and uh, the MR saw really the entire surfaces. On the medial side, uh, this was considered posterior, central, and anterior by the arthroscopist, and again, anteriorly and posteriorly, uh, the articular cartilage could not be evaluated. So that once we realized that, when we went back and reevaluated the lesions, we found that there was actually a very good correlation between MR and arthroscopy in the areas where the arthroscopist could visualize. But it meant that 80% of the posterior aspect of the articular cartilage of the medial and lateral femoral condyles could not be evaluated arthroscopically. In our uh, cartilage lectures, I'll go through this study in more detail. Uh, don't forget that you can also use CT arthrography to uh, evaluate the menisci, and we can see tears where the contrast actually extends into areas of the meniscus. We do this rarely, but in patients who can't have MR scans, uh, CT arthrography uh, can be a tool that you can use. Here's a 55-year-old female. The question was to rule out meniscal tear. On first blush, it looks like there is a tear, vertical tear involving the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Uh, the, the technologists, however, realize that there's motion artifact with kind of a ringing uh, everywhere here where we see these uh, sharp lines. So the, the technologists rescan the patient, and on the repeat MR scan, we can see that the meniscus is completely normal. So be very careful of motion artifact uh, producing. Uh, artificial lesions. So when you see these ringing artifacts and evidence of motion, be very skeptical of your findings, and it's good to repeat it without motion. So that's motion artifact. Here's another example of motion artifact. This is up and down motion artifact, and we can see uh, due to the motion, there's mismapping of the fluid signal here above and below uh, the joint space. So uh, <clears throat> things that you can do to improve imaging with knee arthros arthroscopy, if you have implants, uh, you can increase the readout bandwidth, and then there are a bunch of medical reduction, metal reduction techniques which different manufacturers sell which are valuable.
Uh, what do you look for if you actually uh, are evaluating uh, implants? Uh, if it's a joint implant, you look to see if there's polyethylene wear, and you have to uh, <coughs> get Im good quality images with minimal uh, metal artifact. And even then, you often have to widen the window length when you review those to try to see the polyethylene. Uh, wear is about a quarter of the patient's problems. Aseptic loosening is about a quarter. So these are the first two things you look for. But the loosening, you really have to look at the interface between the metal and the bone, and that's often obscured on MR imaging. <clears throat> and then you look for instability, infections, and all of these other factors. Uh, now, this was a recent study uh, done in 2020, or published in 2020, uh, where they took asymptomatic adults and they uh, scored their menisci, cartilage, bone, tendons, ligaments, and basically overall to see if there were what people would normally think were significant abnormalities in those. Remember, these are uh, asymptomatic individuals, and it turns out that about 30% of asymptomatic adults will have meniscal tears, 62% will have cartilage problems, 52% will have subchondral bone abnormalities, 27% will have tendon abnormalities, not very many will have ligament abnormalities, but the bottom line is that 97% of adults will have some abnormality on an MR scan of the knee. In the early days, when we were trying to get MR of the knee back in the 1980s and 90s to, be, to become a uh, useful tool in imaging patients, there was a lot of pushback from the arthroscopists at that particular time when they realized that it actually was a way to pick up a lot of lesions that they could operate on, then a lot of that resistance subsided. Uh, but one of the problems that we had during the 90s and early 2000s was we were assuming that when we saw meniscal tears that they needed to be surgically repaired, even though back in the early 90s we knew that uh, asymptomatic meniscal tears were quite common in adults. Uh, we'll discuss this when we get to the meniscal section, but we now know that the vast majority of, of adults who have degenerative type tears of the meniscus, especially if they're stable, uh, are better treated non-operatively because if you do partial meniscectomies on those patients, it actually increases the rate at which they develop degenerative disease in the knee. We thought for a long time that that would protect the knee from degenerative disease, uh, but it's actually quite the opposite. So uh, recently, there have been a major change in indications for surgery for degenerative tears of the meniscus. We'll talk about that in more detail later. Uh, but it, to just remember that abnormalities on MR are common, and you've got to correlate the MR findings with uh, clinical findings to actually properly manage the patients. Just because it's an abnormality on MR does not need, mean it needs to be surgically treated. Now, there are a lot of anatomic variants, uh, including ossicles, uh, different um, soft tissue variants, uh, and a lot of uh, variants in the anatomy of the anterior compartment and the menisci that we will talk about. Uh, <clears throat> here's a patient where uh, we can see that, that there's uh, fusions, some cysts, some popliteal cysts, uh, a lot of increased fat, and I really believe that fat is a major risk factor for disease in the musculoskeletal system, so I do comment on it when I think it's abnormal. Uh, and we can also see that there's actually a fair amount of atrophy of the, of the muscles. Muscle atrophy is another major risk factor for musculoskeletal uh, disease and the development of degenerative disease, uh, which we'll talk about in much greater detail over future lectures. But here we can see that there's a loss of articular cartilage of the patella and trochlea, some marginal osteophytes, and even on this cut we can't see it, I would be very suspect that there's a congenital abnormality of the anterior compartment in this particular patient. But uh, the thing to remember is obesity is a significant risk factor, and I think it should be described in imaging reports because it's a risk factor. And then there are a lot of ossicles. Here's a typical one that uh, you've all seen in the uh, 
lateral gastrocnemius tendon. You can see here, very nicely displayed there. And this is the fabella. On the other side, we can see a, uh, well, here's, here's one that's in the palpateus tendon, which is called a cymella. The fabella is a common uh, normal variant in uh, humans. The cymella is not common in the palpateus tendon. And we'll see that there are a lot of tendons can have these ossicles. And in following a lot of patients over time, we found that these ossicles typically present in many of these locations after traumatic injury or partial tears to the tendon. So I believe a lot of these are dystrophic calcification that then become ossified in the healing process from uh, partial tears of the uh, tendons. But we'll talk more about that with specific uh, ossicles uh, in future lectures. And there's a gastrocnemius tercius. There are a number of different variants uh, of the gastrocnemius back here, which can be, most of them are not really significant as a cause of symptoms, but some can be very significant. And here we can just see it. Here it's coming down here as an uh, abnormal muscle and tendon. And this is the tensor fasci serralis muscle. Another example. So here is a, looks like a mass, but it has the same signal intensity really as muscle. It looks like there may be a little tendon coming off of it. Uh, when we look here, we can see that there's an abnormal insertion, uh, and this actually goes up and attaches to the gas, or I mean, goes down and attaches to the gastrocnemius uh, muscles. And we can see it's coming and attaching to the femur. This are a variant. This is a case of someone who was actually symptomatic. A patient came in with uh, uh, exercise-induced pain in the, in the leg. We can see there's a cutoff on the artery and a mass effect displacing the vein posteriorly. When we look here, I'm going to show a video, and I'm going to show how this abnormal uh, gastrocnemius tercius muscle here actually compresses the artery producing these defects. And if you notice in the video, we'll go up and down, uh, start high, and then we'll go progressively lower, and we'll get to a point where the artery here will be compressed. So here, if you look, uh, right there is where it's compressed. There it comes down, and it's compressed right there. Whoops. So uh, so be aware of this. This, this can cause uh, claudication in the uh, leg and can occasionally be, it may be necessary to do surgery on these to decompress the artery. Here's a 66-year-old female with increased pain over six months. And uh, we actually see that there's a lot of funny signal back here by the vessels, here posteriorly. And if we look at the artery, there's this dark area within the artery. And this, this uh, turned out to be a patient had a gastrocnemius variant, which kept compressing the artery, and he ended up having a clot in the artery, uh, which produced ischemia in the leg and pain. Synovial plica are considered variants. Uh, they're, uh, you can have a suprapatellar plica, medial plica, and infrapatellar plica, really all around the plica in the superior recess. Here's a teenager with, who had a painful uh, mass in the region of the uh, suprapatellar pouch. And here we can see with contrast the uh, edge enhance. We can see there's a lot of fluid collection up here, but there's not a lot of fluid within the joint space. And this was a complete superior plica uh, with walled in uh, fluid, which uh, became uh, symptomatic for the patient. There have been described uh, four different types of plica. I won't go through this in detail because I typically don't use this classification, uh, but very rarely you can have a complete plica which can cause symptoms. Another plica which can produce symptoms occasionally, which has been overdiagnosed in the past, is the medial plica. This is very common. When it's thin like this, it's really a cause of symptoms. But when it can become thickened, especially after trauma and swell up, it can actually rub on the articular surfaces here and produce chondromalacia in the area. 
It can also, if it's large enough and becomes swollen, it can get compressed between the patella and the femur and get pinched, producing pain. But most of the time, it's a nice thin line like this, which is not really very significant. If we go more inferiorly, however, we can see in this particular case, it's thickened and is rubbing against the trochlear articular cartilage, uh, which can produce uh, symptoms. Here's the sagittal images showing the medial plica coming down into the Hoffa's fat pad region. And here you can see it overlying the articular cartilage of the trochlea, where it can occasionally cause uh, abrasion. Here's another kind of plica, which we can see coming in here, uh, kind of in the, in the notch of the knee, coming up there, and that's called an infrapatellar plica. Uh, we will talk about variants also of the ACL. Uh, when we get to the ACL talk in there, you can have uh, uh, this kind of plica can often parallel the ACL looking like they're two ACLs. As the importance is looking at its origin and insertion, and you can typically uh, then determine uh, what its origin is. Here's, here's kind of an example where we can see what looks like a double ACL, and if you follow it here, you can actually see uh, the ACL goes to the tibia. The, uh, the other plica actually comes over here uh, to the medial meniscus. So, uh, so a, a plica in this location, uh, if it goes to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, is really considered an anomalous insertion of the medial meniscus and can be misinterpreted as, as other abnormalities and when it's really a normal variant. And here's a patient who came in with chronic knee pain. Here we can see uh, <coughs> an anomalous insertion coming down through here. Here we can follow that. Here's the ACL coming down to the tibia. Here's the anomalous insertion of the medial uh, meniscus coming down here, and we can see it goes all the way to the meniscus where it's attaching to the root attach anterior root attachment of the medial meniscus in that location. This is also called the anterior medial meniscal femoral ligament. Uh, there can be a lot of meniscal variants. Uh, the discoid, we'll talk about in more detail when we get to the uh, session on uh, primarily the menisci, but you can have a complete, often called slapped up uh, discoid meniscus, which covers the entire uh, lateral tibial plateau. The type two, which is just a large lateral meniscus, which is incomplete. And there's a Risberg variant where you have uh, typically an incomplete discoid meniscus and the posterior horn does not attach to the tibia, but attaches to Risberg's ligament. And there's a debate about whether these are actual congenital or whether it's due to old uh, meniscal root tears, which were not recognized, and the normal attachment of Risberg's ligament is the only attachment that's left. And then you can have a very rare ring meniscus where you have a circular uh, meniscus on the, on the lateral side that uh, needs to be differentiated from a bucket handle tear, and we'll talk about that. So this is a 57-year-old female. What's the finding? We can see that there's a little black dot there that we can follow all the way through the notch of the knee. Uh, anterior, we can see there coming across. And there, we can see it very nicely in the sagittal plane. Here we can see it in the axial plane. And this was a medial a meniscal meniscal ligament, which is a ligament that goes from the anterior horn and posterior horn. When it's larger and triangular in shape, we call it a ring-shaped meniscus. When it's very small, it's just a medial meniscal meniscal ligament. The typical meniscal meniscal ligament goes from between the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Uh, so there are a lot of little variants. When they're nice and sharp, don't have abnormal signal intensity in them, then they're uh, and the rest of the meniscus is normal in appearance, then they're probably a normal variant. Here's a 12-year-old male who has giving way. We can see that the typical portions that we evaluate of the lateral meniscus is unremarkable. If we go more medially, what we can see is that there is this uh, <coughs> connection between the anterior horn and posterior horn along the notch of the knee, but the rest of the meniscus looks very normal in appearance and sharp. 
want to go to the coronal images, we can follow it going through here. But notice that the peripheral part of the meniscus is nice and triangular shaped with a sharp free edge. And this central component is also triangular in shape with a nice sharp free edge. And this is a ring meniscus, which is a congenital variant. You have to differentiate this from a bucket handle tear, a central discoid tear, and then the ring meniscus or a lateral meniscal meniscal ligament. 29-month female with bilateral emphysal tibial vera. Here we can just see the typical beaking on the medial side of the knee, uh, which we can see here, and the typical car cartilaginous overgrowth in that area in someone with Blount's disease. Uh, you just have to realize that when they're infants, you can get tibial vera from one to three. In this age group, this typically resolves without the need of any intervention. In the older age groups, it can be more of an issue. And there are different classification systems, which uh, we typically don't use here, as you get more and more of a se severity in the, uh, in the deformity. And if you're working with pediatric surgeons who do surgery on these, then this classification system may be important. Just other examples of Blount's disease. Here's a 10 year old male. We can see a lot of irregularity of the epiphyses, especially on the femur and condyle, with irregular thickening of the growth articular cartilage. And this was a patient who had multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. Uh, other injuries or <laughs> there are things to be concerned about here. Here's an American football player who had a knee injury. Obviously, is he a, uh, an adolescent who still has growth plates? And we can see here he had a Salter Harris fracture through the growth plate, and the periosteum ripped and and flipped into the uh, into the fracture site into the growth plate. So there's a lot of debate. Uh, about what to do about periosteal entrapment. There's one group that feels that these should be surgically removed and taken out so that you get normal growth pattern. Most of the surgeons I deal with here uh, leave these alone and find that there isn't a problem with growth in these and that they're afraid if they go back in and re-damage the, the growth plate that that is, is more likely to produce, to produce growth abnormalities than leaving the periosteum in place there. So uh, that's still a heated debate. 11-year-old female, two weeks post-injury. We can see a lot of uh, bone edema here. Strange regular injuries. Here are further images looking at this. And here we can actually see the fracture going through the growth plate into the metaphysis in this individual. And metaphysial fracture, and this is a Salter Harris IV. We'll have other lectures about bone injuries later. So this patient had a relatively mild injury, twisting injury. What we can see here is a proximal ACL tear with displacement of the ACL inferiorly, and then uh, an injury to the lateral collateral ligament and a lot of surrounding edema. Uh, I don't know why that, I don't know why this is here. Let's forget about this. We'll talk more about this when we get to uh, the ACL tears. Uh, I just want to point out a few things that there's no good location elsewhere to talk about. Here's someone who uh, basically fell and twisted his knee, produced a traction injury, a trabecular bone injury at the origin of the lateral collateral ligament. We can see that there's a medial collateral ligament tear here. The ACL was, was intact. Uh, but what this patient developed axial here, axially we can see a subchondral fracture of the far posterior zone of the lateral femoral condyle. Now this is an area where we often see bone injuries and cartilage disease. The cartilage is intact in this person because this was an acute injury. But I just want to point out that traction injuries at the lateral collateral ligament insertion can produce subchondral injuries, which if they're not properly allowed to heal, could go on to articular cartilage disease in that far posterior zone uh, that cannot be seen well arthroscopically. 
because we've been trying to look at mechanisms of injuries back here. But again, I'm going to talk about this in much more detail uh, when we talk about cartilage disease in later lectures. So why don't we skip on past this. Well, why don't we stop here and we'll uh, carry on in the next lecture from here.